I'm being joined by the Honorable Councilmember Jose Rizar, the 14th District. We, are due, we do anticipate Councilman Pompka Corhan. Uh, as of this moment, we do have a quorum. I want to welcome you back to Plum and Councilman is back from our recess. It feels like a long time ago already. But um, we have several items on the agenda. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, when we call your name, please come to the microphone. Uh, you'll see a, a time clock, and that is the amount of time you have to speak. If you could place yourself, and many of you have written eloquent letters, but to get your main point before your time is up. Um, if you're in a position where there's a series of speakers, and everything that's been said has been stated, it's okay to say I agree with the previous speaker, and give us anything new, so we don't hear the same thing over and over again. Uh, and we would be very much appreciated. So give us your name and address. And uh, as you can tell, the acoustics are not the best in this room. So speaking a little bit slower and into the microphone will go a long way. So that being said, Councilman, we do have several items I think we could address on consent and some that need to be continued. And we will go through those items now. Uh, item one is special. Two, we have special for cards. Three, we can move on consent. Four, we can approve the city. We can approve and have the city attorney prepare the ordinance. There's no speaker cards on that. Five, there are speaker cards, but that one we're going to continue one week. So folks who are here on item five, that will be continued one week. Yes? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, one more time? We'll continue for two weeks. Okay, so on four, we will approve and we'll direct the city attorney to prepare the ordinance. Okay, so then we're just approving the prepared ordinance. Okay. Okay, approve the ordinance. Make it simple. Five will continue for two weeks, correct? Six, seven, eight are on consent with no cards. Nine is special. Ten is special. Eleven. Are there any cards on eleven? Okay, we'll hear the case, then we'll make a recommendation. So we'll call it special. Twelve is special. And um, because of cards. So we do have with us our new director for the planning department, Mr. Michael Legrand. And uh, I'll be asking him to give us this presentation, though he is also... Uh, as a time constraint, so I want to address him. Then we'll go to our appointment candidate, uh, Ms. Tara Jones Hamacher for Cultural Heritage Commission. So welcome, sir. Congratulations. Uh, you're now all of how many weeks, new director? Two weeks, Councilman. Two weeks. Okay, so there's everything to know about the department, right? Yes, it's been a busy two weeks. Okay, well, welcome, Graham. sir. And the microphone is yours. You can update us. So uh, give us some uh, pearls of wisdom. Right. Thank you very much, Councilman. Um, it's been a busy two weeks in the planning department. Uh, we've been focusing on looking at some of our core services, preparing ourselves for the next round of um, the city budget process, looking at doing a lot more with a lot less in terms of resources, but at the same time trying to make sure that we're able to get our community plans finished and accomplished, that we've invested so much time and money into in the last couple of years. So it's really been a few weeks of internal discussions, working with the staff to try and identify where there's some opportunities to mobilize some of our work program that's been delayed the past few years. I know um, our community plan process is one of those items. We've also been working on citywide design guidelines. We had three public workshops that went very well. 
um, we're able to get a lot of input on those design guidelines that will really help shape the quality of development we see in Los Angeles. And our staff's also been diligently working on the bike plan for the city of LA. We'll have um, a number of workshops that are available on our webpage. If you go to www.lacityplanning.org, you can look at our upcoming workshops we have for the bike plan, as well as we're going to have some webinars and public hearings where people can participate online in order to engage us in how um, we have different modes of operation, different modes of transportation in the city, allowing for the public to have safe access to bicycles and trail system throughout the city of Los Angeles. And I'll be coming forward in the next few months to uh, through the legislative process. Um, one of the things I wanted to come here to say today is, uh, first of all, thank you to the committee chair, um, Mr. Reyes, and all your work you've done with us. Um, recently, we worked with you on the, doing a lot of mapping for the medical marijuana ordinance, and your leadership on that issue was vital to the department. Um, you focused our resources and our GIS specialists in a way to provide the city council with information that was accurate and that helped them to make an informed decision on some of the policy recommendations recommended by the city attorney. And that effort was recognized by the American Planning Association and they awarded the city of the planning department an award for innovative use of technology. And we competed against many local um, jurisdictions about how we utilize mapping and technology. And in this case, we're awarded first place and we got an award from the American Planning Association. So I'd like to present to Councilman Reyes from the American Planning Association, Innovative Use of Technology, to Councilman Ed Reyes for the medical marijuana mapping. Wow. Well, this guy's good in two weeks. <laughs> we get an award. <laughs> Michael, thank you. And I want to accept this on behalf of the staff that worked so hard because I know the planning staff took time on their holiday. It took time over the break, and uh, the, the windows were, you can see light in the windows of our city hall way into the morning hours as they worked very hard. So I accept this award on, on their behalf because I know just how hard the staff work, and it's because of them that we are able to produce the type of uh, tools that help the decision makers uh, take appropriate steps in policy development. I mean, steps some people might say it's appropriate, but you know it's always about you know trying to achieve what's best for the city. So I thank I thank you, sir, and uh, this is great, and I'm very humbled by this. Thank you, sir. Um, we do have council member uh, Bill Rosendahl, but council member, can we take this one candidate? We'll do this, then we'll get to you. We'll hold the item up because I know your time is precious as well, and I'd like to call up our volunteer uh, candidate who's been. Um, uh, recommended uh, by the mayor's office, Ms. Tara jones Hamacher for the Cultural Heritage Commission. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. How are you? Hi. I want to first thank you for your patience. Uh, we're running a little bit uh, late. Council went over. Uh, but I want to thank Council Reza for joining me. And I want to just ask if you give you a little background about yourself and some of your goals as, as a commissioner. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tara jones Hamaker, uh, 812 South Spring Street. Um, my background is in uh, real estate and historic preservation. I have been uh, in the real estate industry for the last 20 years, and I founded uh, Historic Consultants back in 1994. We have a focus in uh, pre-development consulting service for large commercial historic projects. We actually specialize in tax credits and financing. Uh, we also get involved um, with a lot of downtown projects. We've been focused on downtown LA, particularly Broadway, for the last 10 years. Um, I am an active member of uh, Councilman Weezar's Bringing Back Broadway initiative. Um, the focus of redeveloping Broadway, we've worked on um, since 2000. We, we started in 2002. We initiated a planning project for Broadway, which took us over four years, and that was actually um, a lot of information that Mr. Weezar used to launch the Bringing Broadway Back initiative. So we're very pleased with our efforts and we've been very involved with multiple committees. I think I serve on every committee that there is. Um, so my volunteer efforts go very deep. In addition to that, I've also served on the Neighborhood Council. Um, I'm a resident of the Fashion District. I spent two years on the Neighborhood Council. So I'm very much into improving the downtown area and making Los Angeles a wonderful place to live and also to recognize our 
our cultural heritage and to save more buildings. I'm very excited about the um, Survey LA and what's going on. I think uh, to serve on the commission at this point in time in the history of Los Angeles would be very exciting. I think I would contribute a lot of balance to the commission and give uh, very good viewpoints from my 20 years experience in the profession. Thank you for everything you do for the city and Councilmember. Just uh, thank you for uh, your uh, commitment to preservation issues. I know you've been very active in downtown and particularly on, on Broadway, as you mentioned, and I want to thank you for your service on bringing back Broadway. Um, I think you bring a, a passion to uh, preservation issues, and we need people like you on this commission. Uh, in my district, we are working on, uh, we were luckily one of the pilot uh, Survey LA areas in Ball Heights, uh, and I also urge the CRA to look at our commercial corridors on uh, getting potentially historic sites in those areas uh, so that we could look at Ball Heights more intently. In Northeast LA today, actually, we're going to take up an issue to incorporate the Garbanza area into the Highland Park uh, HPLZ. Uh, these people have been working uh, very hard uh, to make this possible, and uh, along with the work we're doing on Broadway, I think um, uh, we're working hard to uh, preserve as much as we can, but there's a, a lot more work we can do. You know, the uh, Survey LA is going to take years, and until we have a, a better listings of potentially historic sites, it's kind of like we're doing it haphazardly right now throughout the city. and. Uh, uh, so we got to keep our eyes and ears open and protect as much as we can so that we can preserve our history and the beauty of our history. So thank you for your work. You're welcome. Thank you. Great. Seeing no cards, I'd like to uh, recommend uh, Ms. Hammondshire for the position. Have a second? Second. Can I be the action? I just want to remind you about the City Ethics Commission's Conflict of Interest forms. Yes. There should be submitted to the clerk, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the council floor. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Councilman, we did go through the agenda, and uh, I want to make sure that on item number four, what we're doing there, and with further clarification from the CLA, that we're going to approve the request for the city attorney to prepare the ordinance, uh, and that would be the action on that one. And I believe that on item number 11, we're being asked to continue that for two weeks, correct? So. That one does have cards. Item number 11 is continued to November 16th. November 16th, item number 11. So folks who submitted cards on 11, that's been continued. Item number 11 has been continued for two weeks. So I don't want you sitting here waiting for it to come and then it doesn't happen. If, so I want to make sure you're aware that item 11 has been continued for two weeks. So we do have some people with cards that they submitted. And um, so I want to make sure you're aware of that. That being said, um, the rest are consent items that we've already identified. Have a second on all those items, Council Member? Yes. Okay, so I have a second on all those actions that this, count, this committee has taken. Uh, that being taken care of, uh, we do have an item I'd like to bring forward uh, because of Council Member. Rosendahl, uh, I believe he has a, 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 an issue to, to address, and um, I believe it's item number 10. That's right. And so, Councilman, please. Well, thank you, um, Chair, and uh, Mr. Weezer, and I just want to wish Michael Legrand the best of times in your new position. We look forward to your leadership and working with you going forward. Um, I rarely come before this committee. This is probably the third time or maybe the fourth in my five years in city government. And I'm coming because I took a hands-on approach to this project. Um, I personally visited this site uh, and have seen the parking impact that would be caused by the proposed new condo project located at 1167-6 Chenault. This proposed project would eliminate the access to 34 off-street parking spaces. I met with the applicant and the neighbors and attempted to mediate a compromise. I appreciated, by the way, the applicant giving more time as we continued to have those discussions, um, uh, but one was not reached satisfactorily to address my concerns and the community's concerns. You know, there's a tremendous support from the Brentwood Community Council 
of the Brentwood Residents Coalition and the Brentwood Homeowners Association. You know, Brentwood Homeowners Association represents uh, 2,400 at least, um, 3,500 households. Uh, and at least uh, 35 individuals and other community members have written letters in support of the West LA Area Planning Commission denial. The parking and safety impacts have not been addressed, and I ask that you deny the applicant's appeal and support the West LA Area Planning Commission's determination to deny the proposed projects. As I see it, the findings of the APC were correct. This project is not consistent with the applicable general and specific plans and should be denied. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate you listening to me. Take Thank you, Councilmember. Um, so let's go through the process. I wanted to give him the courtesy of speaking first. Again, his set schedule. Let's have the uh, staff give their presentation. Committee members, my name is Garland Chang, Planning Department staff. Uh, subject case is located in the Brentwood Palisades Pacific Plan Area, R3 zone, medium plan designation. Would, would you mind reading, speaking into the microphone? Okay. And maybe just a little bit clearer on your delivery. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, the request is for a four-story, 36-unit condo with uh, 73 parking spaces. Part of the request involves a density bonus. Uh, the applicant is uh, providing two very low units in exchange for the density bonus. He is also requesting uh, an incentive of going to 56 feet 3 inches in lieu of 45 feet. The Deputy Advisory Agency approved the case. It, in turn, was appealed by the neighbors. Uh, primarily, uh, there is a 5-foot easement on the property line that goes on both sides of the property line. It is an ingress, egress easement for the use of both properties. Uh, but in doing, in allowing the project, the, uh, the appellant feels that it would impact their access to circulation and uh, maneuvering into the parking spaces. Uh, so they appealed it to uh, uh, the Area Planning Commission, the Area Planning Commission, uh, was uh, sympathetic with the request. They granted the appeal and overturned the decision of the Deputy Advisory Agency by denying the case. The I'm applicant sorry, can has you go a, a little bit slower. So, what's the so they denied it to the Area Planning Commission? What was the Area Planning Commission's decision? Uh, area Planning uh, <coughs> Area Planning Commission uh, overturned the decision of the Deputy Advisory Agency and denied the case. Denied the case, which means they granted the appeal. Yes. Okay. So uh, that decision has been appealed to the uh, to Plum. Uh, we have uh, received some information from both sides. Uh, the subdivider is proposing four volunteer conditions to expand the paved area along the access easement, whereby the site setback is increased to 18 feet. Uh, the neighboring property or owners have reviewed those uh, suggestions and feel that they are vague, uh, unenforceable, and uh, constitutes a change to the project. So that's the end of my report. Thank you. Any questions? Any other questions for our staff? Uh, we're going to listen to the public comment, right? Yes, we're going to be hearing. From the from the uh, parent, and if we can uh, have the parent, our parents state your name and the reason for your position. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman Sherman Stacy. I'm here on behalf of Chenault Partners LLC, who is the applicant and the appellant. The denial by the Area Planning Commission was based on. Sir, one you're, you're, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You are here representing them in what capacity? As an attorney, as a consultant? I'm an attorney. You're their attorney. I'm an attorney okay. with the firm of Gaines and Stacy. Okay. Thank you. All right. The, the denial was based upon the sole finding that the project would, in some manner, affect 
street parking, which would be inconsistent with the applicable specific plan. The manner in which it would affect street parking is not because of anything the applicant is building. He meets all code requirements for parking, meets all code requirements for setbacks. It is because his neighbor has an old non-conforming building in which his neighbor has expanded parking spaces to 35, what was originally approved and required only to have 12 and originally only had 20. And because he now has tandem parking, he hasn't the room to back out of the spaces in the tandem space and drive out the driveway without coming onto my client's property. Accordingly, that's how the impact upon parking arises, not because the building is doing anything the code does not permit, but because the adjoining building has a non-conforming use. These facts were confirmed in a building and safety memorandum dated December 10th, 2008, attached to which were the original building permits for the adjoining building, which indicated that a 10-foot wide driveway, the 5-foot easement on either side of the property line, and 12 parking spaces were all that were required in order to be able to construct the building. I have prepared a letter and attached as Exhibit B a copy of the Building and Safety Memorandum. In addition, by letter dated July 26, 2008, the Planning Department Please continue. Okay. The planning, uh, the uh, Department of Building and Safety affirmed that it had never approved tandem parking on the building next door and that a 10-foot wide driveway is adequate to serve any and all parking spaces allowed by the Los Angeles Municipal Code. So we meet the codes, but we're turned down not because of our impact upon the parking, but because in building a code-compliant building, our neighbor will no longer be able to come and use our property in order to get out of his parking spaces, which have been made tandem without permission, where he could get out of them if he used the depth of the space to turn rather than having them be tandem. Now, we spent many months with Councilman Rosendahl's assistance trying to negotiate a compromise. And that compromise effectively came to be we would set the ground floor of the building back 18 feet, overhang the building above it, allow the neighbor to back into that space so he could go out forward as long as his existing building was there. If he demolishes and builds a new building, he can then work out his parking in accordance with code within his own property. Those were the conditions that I have attached as Exhibit A, which are the proposed voluntary conditions. I want to make clear these were volunteered as a compromise, not believe, because we believe that the city has power and authority to say you have to give your neighbor access to 18 feet of your property over which he does not have any adjudicated right. And you will hear that they will claim to have used the property of a sufficient period of time to have established a prescriptive right over it for driving their cars. Whether that will prevail in court or not is not an issue for this committee. That's an issue for another court. But the city cannot deny an applicant because of an unadjudicated claim of another property owner to own some property right on the applicant's property. With Mr. Rosenthal's assistance, we did negotiate to try to see whether we could agree on a formal easement. We could not. We were not prepared to have a formal grant to the neighbor. We were prepared to have conditions that would adjust our building so that our building would not, when constructed, interfere with the use and allow the neighbor to make that use. We do not believe that the conditions are vague. They are clear as to their intent, and they, in our view, solve the problem. The neighbor would prefer to have us grant a recorded easement in their favor. Uh, we are not prepared to do so, and we do not think the city should be in the business of compelling us to do so in order to have something that meets all your codes approved. That's the basis of the appeal. And the reason we think that you should recommend to the council that the appeal be granted and that the project be approved because the finding is so tenuous as to not support 
the denial of the project. Thank you, Mr. Stacey. And um, as a panel, we'll give you more than the two minutes, so we'll make sure we heard your case. Anybody else here to speak on behalf of the appellant? No? Okay. So we'll proceed with our public comment and the cards that are before us, and they will have a two-minute limit. Just keep your eye on the clock. And uh, our next speaker will be Mitch Menzer, followed by Kristen Lerner, and then Ray Nakamura. So please uh, keep your eye on the clock. Give us your name and address. Thank you. Uh, Mitch Menzer, I'm an attorney with uh, Paul Hastings, representing the adjoining property owner, the Schaefer Trust. It's my client's property that's affected by the uh, drive aisle proposed. Um, I want to focus the, the committee's attention on really the only issue that's before this committee, which is whether the Area Planning Commission erred in denying the approval and it, it, it denying the proposal. And as you heard from Councilman Rosendahl, the Area Planning Commission got it exactly right by identifying the severe adverse impacts from the proposal to on-street parking, to traffic, to health and safety uh, by interfering, possibly interfering with access of emergency vehicles. The Area Planning Commission um, understood that the project was inconsistent with general plan and community plan policies regarding fire and life safety, traffic congestion, parking, and aesthetics. And I won't elaborate. Councilman Rosendahl made all of those points exactly on, on target. I do want to um, address these conditions, though, because this represents a substantially changed project that's being proposed now. Um, and we believe that it would be very inappropriate for the committee to approve a, pr a new project that has not had the opportunity to go through the track map process, where it can be reviewed by the advisory agency, the city departments, members of the public, and my client as well. As we understand it, the project has changed both in terms of the uh, access along the property line, but there's also another level of parking. There's another parking entrance. Potentially, the height of the building has been increased. And we don't believe that the city council can approve a, a new project like this by simply approving conditions which are very vague uh, and potentially unenforceable. And in fact, we think that the new conditions, um, if I may continue, the, the new conditions. If you can conclude, please. Um, the new conditions really represent an acknowledgement by the applicant that the Area Planning Commission was correct because it's trying to address each of the issues that the Area Planning Commission identified and the defect that the Area Planning Commission identified. Thank you, Mr. Menzer. Thank can, you, can sir. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, um, so, so you're representing the neighbors of this project and they have appealed because the area planning commission um, denied the project um, and they denied it um, uh, well, well let me start this way so the unpermitted par tandem parking how would you explain that if that's a self is that a self-inflicted um, uh, difficulty that your client has imposed upon themselves and so therefore even if this project goes up and it's you know within the conditions of 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 the planning department and the building and safety department is it was the tandem parking that's unpermitted a uh, self-inflicted well, difficulty the, the tandem parking is perfectly legal it was not it is a, an approval was not required at the time this building was built it was always built for tandem parking and it has always had tandem parking um, I think the important thing to focus on is the Area Planning Commission focused on the effects on the neighborhood and on the community um, more than the individual interests of this property. It recognized that if my client's property didn't have access to those parking spaces, at, under the design originally proposed, there would be 34 cars that would have to park on that's the street. What, that's what I'm trying to figure out here is because I, I would assume that the appeal to the Area Planning Commission was made upon certain, certain, there were certain issues involved there, but it seems now that it's here, there's other or very specific issues involved, and it's gone back and forth. To me, as the appellant is stating their case, they're saying 
the only thing being appealed at this time was whether or not the tandem parking uh, was a problem and created difficulty for the uh, for the neighbor when in fact if they are not permitted and we have to figure out if they're permitted are they permitted or not the tandem parking they're not permitted okay can, can you speak in the microphone please and Please identify yourself. Uh, Garland Chang, Planning Department staff. Uh, we have a communication from Building and Safety that tandem parking has not been approved for the site. Uh, we they have not been approved. And you do need has approvals. Has not been approved for the site. But we, you do need approvals to have tandem parking at this site. Uh, could you repeat that? You need approvals or permits from the city to have tandem parking, correct? Uh, when they went through plan check with this uh, particular structure, it was for a uh, uh, single row of parking spaces. And we reviewed the drawings for that, and what we saw was a single row that was approved. Okay. So, so what, what occurred? But, what but if someone, like? if someone, if they were, if they wanted tandem parking here or any place else, would they? Is there a process for them to apply for permits for tandem parking? Uh, normally, that would be part of the process in plan check. That would be normal. Of it. Okay, so it wasn't even. Yeah. Okay, and let me ask you, what is the issue before us in terms of the appeal? There were some issues at the area planning commission, but what is the issue? before us today on the appeal. what's being appealed um, is it just the parking it's primarily a it's just the parking. Yeah, the, okay. the impact on the it's a budding property owner and whether there's a basis to grant or deny the appeal based upon what we find on the parking issue related to this project not the project itself not the other requirements it's just the parking. yeah, yeah. okay and sir, so we've been told that based upon plan check that we should have had proper tandem parking there on plan check that that wasn't presented at the time. I mean, would you say that your client self-inflicted itself with this, uh, this requirement now that because it has tandem parking, it can access its property, but it, you shouldn't have tandem parking there in the first place? Well, I disagree with that statement. I'm not sure Mr. Chang understood exactly what you're asking because this, the certificate of occupancy for my client's property states that there are at least 20 parking spaces permitted and 12 are required. So at the time the certificate of occupancy was issued, tandem parking was permitted and it was recognized. At the time the property was built in 1958, tandem parking did not require an approval from the city. So it was perfectly legal, perfectly legitimate, recognized in the certificate of occupancy, and in effect, it's a legal non-conforming use. I believe the Area Planning Commission, in making its decision, focused not as much on the impact, in fact, didn't focus on the impact on my client's property, but focused on the impact on the community and the neighborhood if my client's property no longer had sufficient on-site parking. They also identified that the drive aisle that was proposed by the project, by, by the appellant, left only a 12-foot drive aisle. And they questioned whether that would be adequate for uh, emergency vehicles and whether it was in compliance with the city's fire code. And this is something that, again, we feel very strongly that these conditions don't give the city departments, particularly the fire department and LADOT, the opportunity to review what's really a new tract map. In addition, the city Council does not even have a track map that it would be reviewing for this new and revised project. So we feel strongly that the City Council should support the Area Planning Commission's decision, deny this, and if the applicant wants to submit a new track map and submit that to the City Departments and to the public for review, uh, that would be a, a very appropriate next step. Okay. Any, any other questions? Any questions, Councilman? No. Okay. Our next speaker.
Kristen Lawner with Sorrell Associates representing the Schaefer family at 11670 Chenault. Um, I'm going to hand in some letters today. Uh, our clients, the community organizations and individuals in this community are very opposed to this uh, project. As the councilman mentioned, the Brentwood Community Council, the Brentwood Homeowners Association, the Brentwood Residents Coalition, there are 40 letters total in this package opposing this project. This project has simply undergone 14 continuances just to this body alone. We've been waiting three years for a determination on this project. Uh, we've received conditions at the last minute, yet again, changes to this project that we don't have, haven't had time to review or understand. This is not how the process goes. Um, a new project is not the focus of today's discussion, yet a previous project that was opposed and and denied by the Area Planning Commission, that's what is at issue today. We hope that you will uphold the denial of the Area Planning Commission and deny this project and end what has been a very, very long process. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We have uh, Wendy Sue Rosen after Mr. Roy Nakamura. Let's get to Roy Nakamura first. I just, I'm, I'll be announcing people so you can get ready to queue up here. So I appreciate the energy. <laughs> so Roy Nakamura, Wendy Sue Rosen, we have Donald Keller. Mr. Good Nakamura. Afternoon. My name is Roy Nakamura. I'm a registered traffic engineer in the state of California. I'm a senior transportation engineer with the firm of Crane & Associates in West LA. I prepared an analysis of the existing parking conditions at 11670 and 11676 Chanel, and also the parking conditions that would result due to the proposed project. As part of my analysis, I also researched provisions of the LA Municipal Code. My analysis concluded that the proposed project would render the on-site parking at 11670 Chanel unusable and inaccessible. I also concluded that the proposed project would result in up to 34 vehicles currently parked at, the, at 11670 Chanel having to compete for on-street parking or on Chanel or other crowded neighborhood streets. Chanel has insufficient on-street parking capacity, currently it has only space for about 45 spaces along the entire block, and that includes both sides of the street. These 45 spaces are available to 20 fairly large multifamily residential buildings along both sides of Chenal. If the vehicles now parked at 11670 Chenal had to rely on on-street parking, then up to more than, up to about 75% more on-street parking capacity would be required on Chenal. My analysis found that the proposed project would result also in emergency access aisle that would be in violation of the LA Municipal Code. The minimum width for emergency access aisle is 20 feet. I think there's some confusion on the applicant's part between the difference uh, between a driveway and a parking access aisle. A driveway is a roadway that connects the street to a building or a parking facility on a site. The driveway may lead or become an internal roadway or lead to a, a parking access aisle. Here, as, as shown on the diagram I've handed out, the driveway is only a small portion near the curb and the rest, which is shaded in blue, is really the access aisle. <clears throat> I have discussed this issue with Mr. Trotter, the building of safety. Mr. Nakamura, I need you to conclude. I need you to finish. Uh, my analysis concurs with the findings of the LA, uh, West LA APC. Thank you, sir. Wendy Sue Rosen. Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Wendy Sue Rosen. I am here representing the Brentwood Residents Coalition, a grassroots advocacy group whose purpose, among others, is to preserve and enhance the environment and quality of life of Brentwood. I am also a member of the Executive Committee, Chair Emeritus, and former Chair of the Brentwood Community Council. Both organizations, the BCC and BRC, oppose this project and ask that you deny the appeal. Letters have been submitted uh, for the record. It is very important to the community that the proper public process be engaged in in order to allow the community and decision makers, LA Fire Department, LA DBS, Bureau of Engineering, LA DOT, to address the actual project being proposed. That process occurred in this case, and the decision makers found that this project would violate municipal code, fire safety standards, and the general community and specific plans. Now the applicant has, at the 11th hour, proposed a number of new conditions that constitute a new project. If these new conditions, this new project, is adopted here today, it would rob the community and the city's decision makers the opportunity of the proper public process, environmental review, and public input that we rely on. 
We ask today that you deny the appeal. Thank you, ma'am. Donald Keller, and then we'll have Stephen J. Gilbert. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Honorable Commissioners. My name is Donald Keller. I live on North Kenter Avenue and have done so for the last 50 years. I am a Vice President of the Brentwood Homeowners Association consisting of 3,500 single-family residences. You may ask, what have we got to do with apartment houses? We took uh, information by written communication from residents on the adjoining streets, Montana, uh, Lorna Lane, Westgate Avenue, who are immediately adjacent to these two apartment house projects and if those 34 cars are put out on the street our residents are going to be adverse and severely impacted i also want to call your attention you have you have my remarks in a two-page letter that i handed you today i also wrote to you on august 17th but i want to call your attention to something that has occurred since I wrote this yesterday. I understand that there are no plans, no proposals. When I wrote this yesterday, the applicant is trying to evade compliance with city required procedures by asking Plum to approve a new project, no public notice, no plans, no drawing, and no revised track map, and no public hearing on these matters. This is not the way to conduct business. Mr. Bertoni knows that. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Stephen J. Gilbert. And then we have Chris Pearson. Good afternoon, sir. Congratulations. Here we go. I think they're doing pretty well, Vince. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. <coughs> Uh, Stephen J. Gilbert, and I live at 171 North Cliffwood in Brentwood. I have owned our home in Brentwood for 20 years and served on the Brentwood Community Council for 10 years. As a member of the Executive Committee, we submitted a letter in opposition of this project on behalf of the Brentwood Community Council. That letter states grounds for opposition to this project and appeal. I will not repeat the, those grounds here, but want to discuss a relevant, important community safety issue. I'm a registered fire protection engineer and have been one for over 20, uh, 30 years. As a concerned neighbor, I have examined what would be the only location fire apparatus has access to the rear of of the two properties that we're talking about and meets the requirements of section 570903 of the fire code. I believe the, the existing access aisle is a necessary legal non-conforming fire lane to provide necessary access for fire department emergency vehicles. The access aisle is 20 foot wide, clearly marked with no parking signs. As the fire department has not commented on the fire lane in the over 50 years the buildings have existed, it must be concluded the fire department has treated this access as a required fire lane and in conformance with the requirements of the fire code. The applicant cannot modify the existing access aisle fire lane between the two buildings because there is a public easement over this access for use as a fire lane. The fire code requires the fire access aisles be granted to the city without cost, diseasements, and there is no requirement in the fire code for recording of such easements. Can we please finish? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. What was that the end? That was the end. Right on, right on the down. Chris Pearson. And then we'll have James Golden. Hi, my name is Chris Pearson. I live at 11645 Montana. Um, I have a unique perspective with this because I live uh, directly behind the subject property, so my balcony it looks at what would be the back of the building. Um, right now, uh, there's power lines right there, but I have a pretty nice view of the Santa Monica Mountains, and I see a nice sunset every once in a while. Uh, if this project was approved, um, I would look at stucco uh, and nothing else, so it would eliminate any kind of natural light into my unit. 
Um, the four-story complex that they're proposing is completely inconsistent with the neighborhood. It would be the only four-story structure on either uh, My Street Montana or Chenault. Um, You know, the other thing is, is this, this project, to me, it's, it's my opinion, I realize that, but it seems to be motivated solely by greed. Um, that right now, we're, we're looking at, uh, at that subject property, 36 essentially low-income housing units. Um, they're looking to, to take advantage of the density bonus to, to go up to four stories, and they'll be left with two low-income housing units, uh, three if you count the negative financial uh, impact on my unit. So I'm... Uh, Asking, asking you to deny the applicant's appeal uh, once and for all. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker, please. We have Michael Austin, after you. Good afternoon. My name is James Golden, and I live at 11670 Chenault and have uh, done so for approximately 14 and a half years. Uh, I urge you today to deny <clears throat> this appeal based on the findings of the APC, which I believe were correct. Most of everything has been stated, so in, uh, I, I won't go through it all. You've heard it. I would Thank just you. like to make a, another comment. Um, and that is more of a question. Um, why would the city of LA allow development of a new building that destroys access to all parking at the building next door and force 34 cars out of street, out of off street parking and onto an already congested street. Um, I've lived there a long time. I can attest to the congestion. Uh, there are times that you can't even get out of the street that we live on because there are no light signals. And I've actually been in a situation where you can wait 10 minutes to get out onto the street. Um, this matter, I realize, is, has been now dormant for about a year and a half. No changes were made to the proposed project, and there was no public hearing. Um, for no apparent reason or uh, justification, the city planning department approved the project with no public hearing, no redesign, no solution <clears throat> to the elimination of parking, and no resolution to the safety problems. What happened? Why did the city approve these projects after hearing, after the hearing officer denied the application? And how can established procedures of the city and public trust be so disregarded? The APC was correct in its finding, and uh, therefore I see no basis to overturn that correct decision. And uh, I ask you to respectfully please deny the appeal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker, Mike Lawson. And we have Enrique Brown and Susan Schaefer. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, hi, good afternoon. I, uh, my name is Michael Austin, and I am a tenant of the impacted apartment building at 11670 Chenault Street. I've also been parking my car in one of these tandem parking spaces for uh, more than six years now. And I'm really glad I came down here today because when I heard this whole discussion just a few minutes ago about tandem parking, I thought to myself, this is a bit crazy. And for two reasons. One, as it's been stated, tandem parking did not require city approval back in 1958, half a century ago. This is an old building, half a century ago when it was built. It, and I, I heard that it's a legal, non-conforming use, a legal use. The other point is that it's a moot point because there are um, walls, supporting walls, that hold up this building. And Mr. Wiesar, Mr. Reyes, and Mr. Kikorian, this isn't really important. There are, there are walls that hold up the building, every three to four parking spaces, which makes the whole tandem argument, in my opinion, kind of moot. I parked there, and if I only parked in the front space, I'd have the same problem as if I pa parked in the interior space of the tandem parking space. So I don't get what that's all about. And by forcing 34 cars out onto a street that only has 45 parking spaces, it's going to have a huge and horrible impact on not only this block, but the whole surrounding neighborhoods, neighborhood, as you have seen. The gentleman who wants to develop this building will, if, it, if it's approved, will put up these big condos in an oversized building, and after he sells it and makes his profit, he'll be gone. And we'll have all of these problems to live with for many, many decades, if not who knows how long. It will just be a, a huge problem for a long, long time. 
thank you very much for listening to me. I um, hope that you will uphold the APC's ruling. I think it was the correct decision. Thank you, sir. Enrique Brown. And this closes public hearing, public comment. Keep getting cards, and we need to close it. So that's, you can submit your card for the record, but we won't be hearing anymore. Yes, sir. My name is Enrique Brown. I'm a portfolio manager with Silton Properties. Uh, I have been in the property management business for eight years now. Can you speak into the microphone so we can hear you better? Um, license agent. Uh, I, we represent 11670 and uh, Chenault and 11676. I'm pretty aware of the parking infrastructure issue that we're having there. Uh, if this condo project is allowed to be built, it will cut off access to 34 parking spaces. Uh, approving this condo project will not just destroy access to the parking, but it will create a functional obsolescence that will affect the neighborhood entirely. With no on-site parking, the tenants at 11670 Chenault will vacate this building and they rented these apartments with the intent of having, having on-site parking. Uh, this condo project will cause leases to be breached and our tenants will more than likely flee. If there are any new tenants that are willing to rent at Chenault without, without parking spaces, they will be forced to park in the street which will add to the congestion park congested parking nightmare that will affect the entire block, surrounding streets, homes, and condo buildings within the neighborhood. I know of no other apartment buildings on Chenault or in the neighborhood with no parking for tenants. The city requires parking to be provided. If the city approves this condo project, the city will be making a bad situation even worse. Look at this from a safety and functional standpoint, please. And deny this appeal and uphold the APC determination. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Susan Schaefer. Then Dan Schaefer, then Carl Albert. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, my family built the building next door to the applicant's building more than 50 years ago, and um, our family has lived in it. Uh, I've lived in it most of my life, and other family members have lived in it until they've died in it. Um, there, it has always had a 35-foot wide parking access aisle between the two buildings. The applicant wants you to think it's only 10 feet wide, but it's 30, it's 23, sorry if I said, I don't know if I said 35, but it's 23 feet wide. To get a car out of it, and uh, to the car to go forward out of the, out of our parking onto the street, which um, is the only legal way you can go, because backing out is illegal, you have to use the full 23 feet, as you can see. It doesn't matter if there's tandem parking or not. Tandem parking, thank you. Tandem parking was there from the very beginning, 50 years ago. This whole tandem parking thing is just a red herring. It has nothing to do with this case. Um, what's going on is that the applicant wants to build a building too big for the lot, and due to SB 1818 parking height and density concessions, he's um, trying to squeeze too much in and get a few extra dollars and not caring about its adverse effect on the public health safety and physical environment of the community. It would cut off access to the legal uses that have been in effect for 50 years on our property. No one has ever, the properties get inspected all the time, no one has ever said that our parking was illegal and it's, it was approved as it stands today 50 years ago before tandem parking was required to be approved or not approved. It was, it was there and approved. Um, and as has been said, he's replacing he wants to replace 30 affordable rent-controlled apartments on his property with only two, plus put our 14 tenants, or 14 families in our building, out onto the street because they will have no parking. So um, this whole thing is just bad for the community. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Here's just another view okay, of thank where you, he wants the, his building to come. You can see you can't get out, you can't get out of your space. Thank you, ma'am. Can you get one car out? Ma'am. Ma'am, what you're showing us there is you're showing us that you can't get any cars out. I mean, would it be that you could get one car out, you can't get, or you can't get any cars out? Um, I don't think you can get any cars out. This is where he, where his original building plans would have ended, the, would have uh, built, built up to. So you can see cars, there isn't a, enough room to go past the edge of our building. Under current code, there has to be a 28-foot wide parking access aisle to park into parallel um, or perpendicular spaces. Our driveway or access aisle is 23 feet. That's, that's why it's non-conforming. But 
uh, we believe that for his building to allow the proper parking, he would really need to leave a 28-foot aisle. And he's saying 12 feet is enough. And, and then he has all these other conditions that are go back and forth between what he's willing to do and not willing to do. His first appeal to this plum mem uh, committee said he couldn't change it from a 12 feet aisle. It would be too expensive for him. Then he said, I can do 20 feet when we were negotiating with him. Thank then you. he reneged on that deal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Schaefer. And then Carl Albert. I'm Dan Schaefer. Susan Schaefer, you just heard from, is my sister. Uh, we both grew up in that building, and uh, I actually nailed some of the nails in the building as, my, as a child. Uh, our parents uh, believed in us taking part in the family business. Our parents built that building so that we could have a place to live and have a business and have some income at the same time. We have lived in that building all of these years. I've lived there most of my life with a little bit of times away. We have maintained it as, a, as our home, and our tenants find themselves very at home there. At the most recent uh, code, infection, code inspection program, the SCEP, there was not a single violation, and the, the inspector found that very unusual, and he congratulated us on that. I remember at the time there was complete approval for our parking, and I'm just going to show you this again. The code requirements are not based on whether there is tandem parking or not. They are based on these obstructions. You cannot get out of a space. If they are going to build a building here, this car, this car is representing where their project would be. With these obstructions, the code requirements require currently 28 feet. There's 23 feet currently, but you can see that with these obstructions that are part of the structure, a required part of the structure, uh, it, would, it is impossible to exit if you only have this amount of space. The tandem parking issue is a red herring. Uh, tandem parking was not required to be approved at that time. Uh, I, I personally met with Nick Trotta. We have a letter from Nick Trotta uh, in which he states that the driveway only refers to the curb cut and it does not refer to the turnaround area that you need to access the parking. And this was brought up as a red herring using the term driveway uh, uh, incorrectly, indicating it means this area. It does not. And we have a subsequent letter from Nick Trotta which makes that clear. Thank you, Thank you very much. You, some of you keep saying it's a red herring. So to me, red herring means that it's this other issue over here. You're flagging this when it doesn't really matter. What's the real issue here? What? The real issue is that our, our parking is approved, and, the next approved one, please. and is legal. Oh, our, park our parking was always legal. If you look at our building, the depth of our spaces is clearly for, for tandem parking. And it was that way from the very start. No one would build a building with depth that way if they intended only one row of cars. They, it was designed for two rows of cars, and there simply was no process of approval of tandem parking in 1958. I met with Nick Trotta. We have reviewed the laws, and that requirement did not come in until approximately 1969. So the issue is that our parking always intended to be this way. It was approved in this way, and it would be impossible to access our parking in or out if the building were built in the way proposed. Thank, thank, you, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Carl Albert, Richard Bosch, then Cindy Newman, and that will conclude our public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Huazar. Mr. Huazar, you asked, uh, Carl Albert, I'm here as an attorney representing uh, the owners. I'm also the husband of Mrs. Schaefer, uh, and I've lived in that building, so I speak as a percipient witness. You asked the right question, what's the real issue? There's only one real issue, and that is, was the APC correct in finding that the proposed project is inconsistent with the general and uh, specific community plans? Uh, the APC findings are quite clear about that, and they cite the provisions that require that a new project must be compatible with the adjacent use, the adjacent landowner. They must take into account existing parking, traffic conditions, and I won't cite code section by code section. There's only a few pages of these findings, but the findings are exactly right on. The proposed project is inconsistent with the general and specific applicable plans. The red herring, uh, the, the uh, parking issue, the commissioners dealt with. Commissioner Foster herself said this is a red herring. It wants you to know that the APC commissioners 
visited the site. They tried getting their cars in and out. They talked about that on the record in the transcript, which is in your file. They said it's impossible. And it's not possible whether you have the front space or the back space. It's the walls that stop you from turning. So the building was built for tandem parking. And what I'm, I'm really embarrassed by Consul's misrepresentation to this committee about there is no approval in the file for tandem parking. That's really pulling your legs. Why? Because in 1958, there was no tandem parking ordinance. They know that. This is a pattern that's gone on here. The first tandem parking ordinance in Los Angeles was passed in 1969. So of course there's nothing in the file to show approval. It wasn't required. But it was built to have tandem parking. You should know that. The spaces are that deep. And as a matter of fact, when the, the certificate of occupancy speaks of 20 cars allowed, you couldn't park 20 cars without tandem parking because there aren't 20 stalls. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you. Richard Bosch. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Um, I'd like you to look at What's your name and address, please. Uh, my address is 11670 Chenault. I've lived in the area 30 years. I own property in the area and several businesses in the area. And if you, I think it's pretty clear what's been presented, the big picture here. If any of you are confused still what's going on or do, don't get it, I suggest you go down there, try to pull your car in, look at the existing plans for the new building, and go, oh, this makes no sense. It lacks all common sense. It's ludicrous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, the shortest one. Cindy Newman. Thank you. Oh, I can't reach this. Thank you very much. My name is Cindy Newman. And I live right next door, right behind the building at 11645 Montana Avenue. And I've actually been an interested party in this project since the first hearing was held back in October 2007. And as such, I can immediately address the parking and the access issues because I can literally see onto the property whether there was a tandem parking, whether there was one parking, I don't know how these people get out of their parking spaces because, I mean, I could film a comedy show on it. It is that difficult. There is so little room to traverse out there. Um, in addition, I see that my own street, Montana Avenue, which I've been living on for almost 20 years, is one of the few streets that actually provides east-west access in Brentwood. It's far too often overly congested, and I and my fellow homeowners are often unable to either enter or exit our own garage and driveways. Due to the massive tra traffic congestion that has become such a blight in the Brentwood neighborhood, and especially on these particular streets. One of the main reasons I purchased my condominium back 20 years ago was due to the neighborhood feel and the lack of exceedingly tall and towering condos and apartment buildings that result in increased congestion, lack of sunlight view, and create an eyesore for the community. We're already in Brentwood, one of the most congested areas in Southern California. Erection of this new project will not propose any benefit to our community in any way. And I thank you for stopping it. Thank you. All right. Right on the, right on the money. That concludes the public comment period. I did want to ask the uh, council deputy, and uh, the council mayor did speak to the uh, months of that years of negotiation and looking back and forth. Uh, is there one condition and or one, uh, there's something that you could point out that brought the council to this conclusion. Could you share that with us? Sure, by all means. Um, the one thing um, besides the huge community outcry was going to the site and seeing the what you've just heard from the last three, four people, five people about the parking, and then on further investigation looked at the APC findings and that the APC was 
was not able to adopt the mitigated negative declaration um, because they determined that the parking and safety issues had not been adequately addressed. Um, safety, especially with regards to the width of the access aisle for fire and safety reasons and parking for the neighborhood and, um, as you've heard, the concerns. So that's definitely what tipped the balance. Okay, thank you. Any questions for uh, the district representative? Yeah, oh, not for the district representative. Yeah. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Any other questions? questions? Yeah. Uh, if I could ask the uh, ZA and the uh, applicant to the microphone, please. Um, you know, we, what we just heard from also the zoning administrator, who are you the one who originally approved the project? Garland Chang, Planning Department staff. Uh, the person that approved this case is now retired. Okay, so I mean, what we just heard right now are some pretty compelling arguments that should this project go up. Uh, initially, I thought, you know, the issue tandem parking that one car probably wouldn't get it, be able to maneuver, but now it seems like what I'm hearing, if, if true, that no, no one could park there now or possibly pull out in and out, so it would, um, it would make their parking situation there um, pretty bad. They wouldn't be able to use those parking slots. They showed the picture. They said, this is where the building's going to come up. You know, I'm visually looking at it for the first time, and, and I tell myself, yeah, I mean, they, they can't use their parking spaces anymore. Is that accurate? I do not believe it is accurate. I believe it would reduce the number. The certificate of occupancy says 20 spaces. We've heard 35. Uh, obviously, it grew from something at the certificate of occupancy to this 35 number. But there's a building at 11752 with the exact same configuration and a 10-foot driveway. And in Exhibit C to my letter, there's a photograph of their parking spaces and a drawing of how they work. You pull all the way to the end of your space. You leave an aisle between the two in each of these 30-foot bays. And then you back out under your overhang into the 10-foot driveway and go out. That's how it was designed in the beginning. And the solution, obviously, is, well, you've got to give some of your land to your neighbor. That's basically the, what the city is saying is, we can't let you redevelop this property unless you give some of your land to your next door neighbor to solve the problem. I'd like to simply make one point. We have a 30-unit building with 24 spaces. We will have a 36-unit building with 72 spaces. Now, that doesn't deal with the neighbors, but it does deal with some of the street parking impact that our existing building has that would reduce it. But I mean, the, the, clearly the solution is the neighbor needs some property the neighbor doesn't presently own. Uh, and we, under the conditions, are prepared to allow them to use it. We do not wish to grant them a formal easement. That was part of okay. the negotiation. So they could use it. They could come into your property to do a or, turnaround? Yes. Or, or is there going to be a wall there, some structure where they cannot come into it? We're prepared to set back the ground floor 18 feet from the property line, let the upper floor overhang it, have a sufficient clearance that's the same clearance they have in their garages. I so see. the same car that can go in their garage can come underneath back into the area and go out forward into the driveway. That is the proposed conditions. And although people say it's the last minute. That is a condition. That, 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 no, that is one of the conditions I have proposed. It was not a condition imposed by the associate zoning, uh, excuse me, deputy advisory agency when the project was approved because the dep the and, and if that condition is adopted, you feel comfortable moving forward with your project? Yes. It sounds to me, I mean, it seems like, I, I asked earlier, because there's a, in every project there's a number of issues, whether, you know, parking and the environmental, but on this one it seems like this is the one issue and that has come up on this project. But it seems to me that everyone who spoke today is concerned about their ability or inability to use the parking should the project move forward. But as proposed, it seems to me like they're going to have a very difficult time to move forward. But if that condition is in there, and they can use your property. I don't know how you do it legally without, you know, putting in there some type of easement. I mean, if just, 
you know, you have to use an easement, right? What other legal tool do you use to do that? Well, all we want is that it simply be a condition of the map as opposed to a formal easement will comply with the condition of the map. Okay. Um, but, I mean, I don't know. It seems to me that they, they've, they've been, they've gave some pretty compelling stories should you build your project as is, that they're going to have a very difficult time using the parking spaces. They do have some rights. It's, it's non-conforming use that has, uh, you know, they, they have some rights and, and I don't know what the some court would say. come but, upon our property? Yeah. But if you give them the permission or you provide the condition, I think it will resolve that. Uh, and that is what our Exhibit A proposes. And Exhibit E is the drawing of the building showing the setback. Okay. Um, to the zoning administrator, you originally approved this project. And on the parking issue, would it make their parking spaces moot? I mean, uh, unusable, I should say, as proposed? Uh, the original decision maker had some concerns about that. Uh, but it is difficult to determine how many spaces would actually become invalid or non-usable. Okay, and do you believe that the 12-foot the driveway created by the subdivision is consistent or inconsistent with the district plan, with the uh, general, what are we looking at? Is there a specific plan here? Uh, how many feet did you say? Does this area have a specific plan? No. No. Okay, so one of the public speakers said there was a specific, it was inconsistent with the specific, there is no specific plan. No. Is it specific with anything, with uh, our guidelines in that area, whatever guidelines apply? No. It's not? Uh, there isn't any. There's no guidelines whatsoever. Okay. Pretty confusing case. Okay, well, uh, we've heard from the uh, appellants, we've heard from our staff, we've heard from all the interested parties. Uh, is there a motion on the floor to move this in any, in any way? Well, I'd like to then propose, uh, knowing how hard the council office works in each one of our districts, there's been a lot of issues here, like you said, Council Rizar. Uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, some ambiguity here in, in terms of how we're uh, perceiving the issues given, you know, your, your perspective. But I would like to um, move that we deny the appeal filed by Chanel Partners and thereby sustain the entire decision of the West LA APC in not adopting the MND and denying the track map for one Lot 36 unit condominium project with two units at a site for very low income affordability on a 0.58 acre site located at 11676 Ocean Mount Street, subject to modified findings as adopted West LA APC. And that would be my recommended action. I don't know if there's a second. Your recommendation is to deny the appeal by the applicant. Um, I would uh, support that, um, but I'm conditioning that on by the time this, is this going to council? Yes. This will go to council, right? Uh, I feel comfortable that in the event between now and then, if the conditions as proposed in the exhibits to allow those turnarounds to be greater, that I would uh, support um, the project moving forward, but for right now, I'll give a second to your motion. Okay, so there's an opening there, and I understand that, and that would be okay. So that is the uh, action, and uh, Councilmember Kokorian. Uh, oh, oh, that's right, he, he came in halfway through the process. So, uh, this will be the action of the, of the committee. Uh, and uh, Councilor Kukorin was not present during the public hearing, at least partial, so he stepped out for this decision. And that will be the action then that uh, will move forward. Uh, is there a date for this going to Council yet? September 22nd. So between now and September 22nd, uh, uh, as understood by Councilor Wiesar, uh, there's still room for dialogue. He's leaving it, the, the door open, but that's up to the parties at hand. So denial is the action of this committee. 
Thank you, colleagues. Uh, our next item is item, and I'm going to jump to item number nine, only because we have the LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department officers here. And I apologize, I would have had you first. Uh, I know you've been waiting patiently, and I can, I can feel your presence. <laughs> like, when is this guy going to finish? Uh, but um, Mr. Brown, would you like to introduce item number nine, please? Good afternoon. Nicholas Brown, Associate Zoning Administrator. The matter that is before you was actually initiated by the LAPD. Through a 28-month period, they were able to log 16 arrests at the subject site. Of those 16 arrests, 10 of them were for controlled substance, 4 were for violation of the hotel registration laws, and 2 were for deadly weapons and a felony warranty. At the public hearing that I held in February, I not only learned of these issues, but also several more. One, that the operator was in violation of 1270 of the municipal code that's related to adult entertainment that is due to piping in adult movies into each room. They were also in violation of the municipal code as it relates to parking. They were allowing the use of their parking spaces by another use. Also, they were in violation of the building code because they constructed a, another unit that was used for the caretaker and that was done without a building permit. At the conclusion of the public hearing, I ruled that this was a public nuisance and I imposed conditions. The conditions that are imposed are the standard conditions that we use for revocation of these type of issues. They're also similar to the conditions that were used in 2002 on the hotel adjacent to this one. The two issues that were raised in the appeal, one is, is that there's a condition related to the cost of 24-hour security, and the other issue of contention was that they cannot charge one price for a room. Before I address these two issues, I do want to correct the administrative record. On page 8 through page 9, there is duplicate text, and that needs to be taken out. Also, on page 28 through 46, there is also additional duplicate text, and that will be taken out. And I will submit to the city clerk an amended report. But the issues of the appeal have nothing to do with those errors that were made in the determination. Specifically, this issue of security, there is no condition on security for 24 hours. If you refer to page 27 of the determination, it states why. I believe that instead of spending the money on security at this time, the money is best spent in getting other issues resolved on the site. However, there will be an approval of plans review in several months, and if at that time they have not resolved the issues, then at that time I may require there to be 24-hour security. The other issue that was raised is a condition of the approval, and that's condition 15H on page 5, and that's related to room rents. Their issue is that um, they cannot charge one price for a room. What the condition states is that the room shall be rented for a one-night stay. That is a standard condition we put under these type of cases, and the reason we put that condition on is to ensure that it's not going to be an hour rate type of facility. That concludes my presentation. Are there any questions at this time? So, of the two that is on record that the appellant thinks they're appealing, there's only, there's only one, which is the room rate. That's, that's correct. Okay, okay. Okay, that being said, we've had the, well, any question, Mr. Brown? No? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Brown, just stand here by. And I'd like to ask the officers to come up and uh, have asked of Officer Justin Ford. I was going to say Officer Ford. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Officer Justin Fuller. I'm assigned to the Los Angeles Police Department's Detective Support Device Division uh, Community Problems Unit. Uh, we're specifically assigned to work with the, uh, the local area, which is Newton area, and help them to coordinate and address vice activity in the area, uh, and specifically uh, nuisance locations uh, like the activity that's been occurring here at 4112. 
Uh, we don't really have much to add uh, in addition to everything that's been put into the record previously with the zoning administration. We would like to, uh, however, point out that uh, since February, uh, uh, when the uh, original hearing was held, there have been two additional arrests made at this location. Uh, one for keeping a disorderly house uh, where an undercover officer posing as a prostitute and another posing as a John rented a room expressly for the purposes mm -hmm. of conducting prostitution activity. Uh, the uh, manager was cited at that location. Uh, and then as recently as July 9th, I believe, uh, they were cited for again failing to complete their uh, uh, registration cards in accordance with the uh, LAMC. Uh, we feel that the conditions as proposed and uh, enacted by the ZA are, are lenient and reasonable and, and we would support uh, any decision that would keep them in place. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. And thank you for having work with the officers and the young for being with us today. Um, we do have another speaker card and that is uh, Ben Haas, and I apologize, I mispronounced the last name. Manoj Chiri, please come on up. Manoj Chiri. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I didn't you know speak that into I, the microphone? Yeah, I didn't know that I have to come and talk here regarding my case. Otherwise, I'm going to come with my attorney. Can I they have more time to come later with my attorney? Because I have a tenant in my property. I am the landlord of the, the motel, and I lease my motel to somebody, Ashish Patel. And uh, I'm not happy with the zoning that they put that condition on that property. It's not easy to follow everything for uh, they, uh, they put it over there. So, so you want to continue this item? Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Attorney, City Attorney, um, what is before us? Can we grant that uh, continuance? The uh, expiration date is 928. 928? Yes, so you don't actually have time to do that. We don't. No. Week, well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you have one week, but that's that's all because otherwise. Uh, okay. So yeah. this coming Tuesday. Okay. Is when we meet again, and it's the last time that that's about as much time we can give you. Okay. We had the police department here waiting, and I'm more focused on on the quality of life issues. Okay. Uh, and the council office is very concerned with quality of life issues there too, so we have to get some control of what's happening there. I don't know if this condition go, runs with my property or not because at, uh, because of the management it wasn't good. I don't want it that this condition goes with my motel. Well, the condition will be with the property. And how can I protect myself for not going to my title? Well, I think you need to speak to your attorney. Yeah, that's why. Right. And at this point, um, the colleagues will be comfortable with the one-way continuance. Yeah. So we'll continue this one week, and uh, hopefully you will get your records in order and uh, understand your, your, your rights. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have a concern here in the community. If you heard the officer, there's many incidents of arrest. Uh, it is a nuisance, and there's a problem here, a real problem. And for the officer to be here all afternoon willing to speak to us tells me just how serious it really is. So the area then, is not, the area is totally is like that. The area is not good, and they want us to keep the motel as a Hilton motel. And I, I represent a pretty tough district, and every property owner must be held accountable for their property. Okay. And uh, you can point to the area as an excuse, but there's no excuse for not running a business that does not penalize. I mean, that's something we need to, to, yeah, to underscore. So answer. we'll continue for one week. Is that okay, Councilman? I will not be in town next Tuesday. Um, I do want to address this point, though. This is a discussion we have had months ago. This can, is nothing can you new. Please, just a minute. Can you please take a seat? And then we'll have Mr. Brown. Please take a seat. Okay. Mr. Brown, come to the microphone. 
This is a discussion uh, the owner had with me some time ago, and her concern about not having a cloud on the title, I stated it was not enough for me to not take an action. Uh, she is very clear of what these conditions do, and I don't know what a week would do, uh, but if you do come back in a week, I will not be able to be here. I am on a vacation for that four or five days. Do we have able staff that can represent you? Uh, yes, I will assure that you do that. Colleagues, we, we have a decision here. We can continue or we can take action, uh, well, given Mr. Brown's observation. Yeah, Mr. Council Member, I, I think for me the evidence is clear cut. Um, having the LAPD here and telling us just recently there are some other violations, uh, I'm, I'm ready to act today. I'm not quite sure what the additional week would buy us, at least from my point of view. Um, uh, it seems to me that proper, I believe in due process, I believe in fair hearings and proper notice was given. If uh, the person that is here without their attorney, that's uh, their responsibility. Um, I, I, we have an impending deadline coming up. I would hate to miss it because we have quorum or not at the next meeting. We don't know what's happening. I, uh, there's overwhelming evidence on my part that we, we should act to uh, make sure we have a more secure environment at these at this location council given the um, information by mr brown and the conversations we've already had in the past and uh, i understand the urgency the council office spoke to me before and how concerned they were and listening to the officers and their presentation i hate to have them come off the streets again take away from the duty to come back to a hearing um, and, and i would tend to agree with you and so I would move that we um, we deny the appeal and sustain uh, the sustain the CA decision, right? And sustain yeah. the CA. And Councilmember, do you have a perspective here, or would like to share your thoughts? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Did, I wasn't quite sure. Did the applicant get an opportunity to uh, voice her her um, opposition to your action, or did she just ask for the continuance? If you're going to take action today, you should probably give her an opportunity and to let's do that. Do that then. I want to make sure we, we follow this properly, and thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Benas, uh, we need to come on up. Um, we're going to, uh, I want to make sure we follow this properly. Uh, so our actions right now are to make a decision today. Oh. But we want to make sure you have the opportunity to state your case uh, before we reach our final decision. Uh, you've already had the dialogue of our tendency not to provide a continuance. So this is your chance to give us your opinion, your perspective on your case. You know, my English is not good enough to explain whatever that I want to say. That's why I asked, ask for more time to bring somebody because as she, my tenant, he doesn't know English good, also me. That's why I ask for somebody else to talk about this case, if we, I can get one more week time. Well, can you do your best? Because we're not going to grant you one more week. OK. Uh, I don't know what to do. You know, they ask for the key registration. Everybody that comes over there, they have to register their name over there. And some condition that they put it over there, my tenant didn't know that they had to appeal that one, not the one that they already gave it to them. For example, the 24 security, uh, security it's not included in their condition, because, but my, client, my tenant asked for the 24-hour security to appeal it. It means that we didn't understand good in this situation. And they tried the best during these six, seven months, and they didn't have that much prostitution or something over there. They put the sign, they put the, the big sign that they cannot, uh, people come. But how do they know that is, uh, they rent the room for one day, but how do they know that they're going to keep it for three hours or four hours? The condition that they put it over there is so strong. Some of them especially. The one that they have to register their name over there, any the visitor that they come, 
and the, the other one is to rent the, the, the rent control for the each room. It means that they cannot lease it for less than one day or whatever, as much as I know. Okay. But we already put the sign, they already put the camera, they already added, whatever they added or asked over there, we did it. There is no entertainment to, uh, for adult entertainment. We followed everything over there. But the only thing that we cannot accept it is uh, some of them. I understand. You know, when I'm looking at the summary, this begins on August 2nd, 2010, where the appeal was filed. Uh, by Ashish Patel. And so that tells me there's been quite a bit of time between August and today to understand what's going on on this case. Yeah, I kept asking my tenant, go read over there and get the attorney by yourself. This is your problem that you have it on the property. And just let me know which one you can do, follow it and which one you cannot. The only thing that they did, they came here and appealed for the things that even is not uh, exist in the, the condition. Right. Because I'm not in the motel at all. I, I don't know what to run it. I know. And again, ma'am, I, uh, I sympathize and I understand and I, and I, I see uh, and understand what, what you're saying to me. But we have a community right now that's suffering. We have police resources being used because of the lack of management, the lack of control. You're the property owner. Okay. And so we need to take care of the city, the community, and this is our charge. How about so we, we, the management? Well, again, we're going to act today. You have between today and the city council to speak with the council office, mm -hmm. and that'll be council member. Uh, Jan Perry in District 9, you have the ability to speak to them directly. So if there's any changes and or approaches that might satisfy your needs as a property owner, that's the window that you have. But if I were you, we're going to move on this, we're going to deny the appeal, and we're going to move on this and take this to the next level. But at this point, Myself and as heard from Council Melissa, we put a lot of weight on what the police have to say and trying to create a quality of life that it, that, that area merits. So that would be, uh, Council Member, do you have any? I want to make sure I offer you the opportunity, sir. I guess just to follow up on your, your point, Mr. Chair, I'm looking at the Zoning Administrator's report and in February, uh, the property owner was saying, well, I need to get a lawyer involved and please let me know if I have to get a lawyer there was a property owners representative that participated on February 19th and offered so uh, I, I agree with you I think I, while I'm sympathetic to the yeah. what you've expressed there has been ample opportunity to engage your lawyer in this and I think you need to talk to your lawyer if you need oh. uh, them to be more involved than they have been but um, I, I think we have in front of us what we need right now. Okay, thank you. So that will be the action of this committee. And so spe please speak to your council office and see what else can be done. But they're the last uh, uh, level of input before the full council takes an action. Thank you. Thank you. So that will be the action of this committee. Will we cover all our bases, uh, Mr. Uh, Cielo? So you deny the appeal. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. That takes care of item number nine. And Roberto, what's the next one? Um, item number four, council member, I believe the city attorney needs to read a statement into the record relative to a development agreement. Uh, yes, uh, Ken Fong, deputy city attorney. Uh, this matter is described in the staff report, and our office had submitted several, several versions of the uh, uh, development agreement and we are recommending approval of the ordinance authorizing execution of the version of the development agreement dated 9 14 2010 uh, this version requires compliance with the special events fee ordinance as codified in the LA municipal code 
So this is our third shot at this item? That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got it straightened out. Three's the charm. <laughs> okay. So we'd ask this committee and have a second on that? Yes. It, it, and the city attorney will prepare the ordinance consistent okay. with that development agreement. Okay. Thank you. Next, Roberto. Uh, that would be item number two, Councilman, which is a city planning uh, report it's an ordinance relative to the establishment of the Highland Park Garbanza HPOC. Okay, you can have the staff come forward. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yes, good afternoon, uh, council members. Rogelio Flores and Jason Chan with the City Planning Department. Um, we'll do a brief overview in the interest of time, and if you would like a more expanded um, version of it, uh, we're more than happy. Uh, to provide it. Uh, the proposed item uh, before you is the expansion of the existing Highland Park Historic Preservation Overlay Zone to include the Garbanza neighborhood within the Northeast Los Angeles Community Plan area. The proposal has been endorsed by CPC and has gone through workshop and public hearings both at CPC and the Cultural Heritage Commission. The matter uh, has widespread uh, community support. Uh, and we wanted to make you aware that due to the impending October 25th expiration of the current ICO, the Department of City Planning has added an urgency clause to the ordinance and is submitting it along with additional findings to you. We ask that you move the item with the revised ordinance so that the, um, the HPOZ can be effectuated prior to the expiration of the ICO. Uh, the revised ordinance would supersede the ordinance that was originally transmitted to you and I believe the revised ordinance should be in your packets. We have extra copies here uh, if you need them. Okay, anything else you'd like to add? What does this do, I mean, just for the sake of the public who might be listening or reviewing this, can you highlight some of the, um, the positive impacts or the intent of this expansion? Okay. Um, yes, the, um, the expansion of the HPOZ uh, will provide historic preservation uh, protections, in other words, regulations in addition to the base zoning that currently um, exists in Garvanza. Garvanza, through the historic resources survey that has been conducted over the last two or three years, has been identified um, as, a, as an invaluable historic uh, feature of the city of Los Angeles. And uh, on that basis, uh, the planning department feels that extending the existing historic preservation overlay zone regulations, which are intended to protect historic resources, is appropriate, and we recommend it. Great. I'd uh, like to ask Colonel Rizard, uh, the, for the most part, it'll be District 14. Is there a public yeah. yeah, we do have three. Want to take the yeah, public first? Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Or comments? All right. Uh, thank you, sir, and uh, thank, thank you, gentlemen, you. for your hard work. Um, I'd like to call up our uh, uh, very patient people here. Uh, we have Carmela Gomes, Tina Miller, and Charles Fisher. And I want to thank you uh, for your patience. It's been a long afternoon. <laughs> and I uh, appreciate your patience. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, on behalf of the high, I am Carmela Gomez. I live at 1326 North Avenue 54 in the York Valley uh, region of Highland Park. On behalf of the Highland Park Heritage Trust, for which I am now acting as president of the board, I am here today in support of the, ex the expansion of the HPOZ of Highland Park to include Garvanza. Um, Los Angeles's history is vibrant and alive. All neighborhoods of the city need to be as proactive as the communities of Garvanza and Highland Park and preserve the heritage we all share. All our children learn from all of us to be stewards of their community. In fact, uh, one of the Tenants of the Highland Park Heritage Trust's mission is to educate the community for the purpose of developing preservation advocacy. So therefore, we, the inclusion of Garvanza, which is the first town in Northeast Los Angeles, um, and the renaming of the Highland Park Garvanza HPOZ is the right thing to do for our collective prosperity. Thank you so much for listening to me. I just want to add, um, 
I want to thank you for your hard work. I know you've been a, a, a strong support of our youth as an educator and continue to work with us in many different circles. And it's good to see your advocacy here now. I want to thank you for your thank hard you work. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Tina Miller? My name is Tina Galata Miller, and my address is 6433 Crescent Street. I live in Garbanza, and um, I'm representing the Garbanza Improvement Association. Uh, I have lived in Highland Park since 1984. I moved to Garbanza in 1996 when my husband and I purchased our 1905 Victorian vernacular home. I would like to thank Councilman Jose Wizar for his tireless support and for going on that small little walking tour that day mm -hmm. when we took your, you and your staff out to look at the uh, area. And he recognized right away the importance of this uh, HPOZ and the protection it would give our area. Um, I would also like to thank Rosa Rivas, Nicole Posser, Carmela Gomez, and especially Charlie Fisher for their tremendous perseverance and support of our long 15-year pursuit of the HPOZ for Garbanza. Also, the Highland Park Heritage Trust has been a huge supporter and guided the Garbanza Improvement Association through so much of the complicated process. I fully support the Highland Park Garbanza HPZ expansion for so many reasons. Garbanza is a special place and is made up of primarily pre-World War I and World War II residences and commercial buildings. Its array of architecture is quite diverse like its residents. It is an old neighborhood that helped start the arts and crafts movement in America. Some of the original artists and craftsmen lived and worked in Garbanza, such as the USC School of Fine Arts and the Judson Glass Studios, and it is still operating in the very location today. This neighborhood is intact, and that is not an accident. I personally saved several structures from illegal, illegal demolitions and crooked contractors. I restored and helped project manage an 1887 Victorian home at no cost for 18 months for my neighbor. The result is amazing and stunning, and it stands as a testament to Garbanza and its residents' commitment to protecting its history and integrity. We ask today that you approve the expansion on behalf of Garbanza's amazing history and natural beauty so that so many more people can witness and enjoy this marvelous piece of Los Angeles history. Thank you. Thank you, you Ms. Miller. Thank you very much. Uh, Charles J. Fisher. Charlie Fisher, 140 South Avenue 57. As the chair of the Highland Park Historic Preservation Overlay Zone Board, we wholly support the addition of Garbanza to Highland Park, and I'm glad it will be the Highland Park Garbanza HPOZ. Uh, the name Garbanza had been lost after World War II. It, um, the Greater Highland Park Association back in the 20s had pushed for a much larger clout by just having one community. And uh, Garbanza was just remembered for so many years until 1997, with the help of the Garbanza Improvement Association, we were able to get the Garbanza name reestablished. And now the uh, culmination of this is the addition of the Garbanza section to be known as Garbanza, of course, of the HPOZ. Um, the board has looked this over. We felt that we won't have a problem dealing with a few additional items. We have the largest HPOZ in the city as it is, and we've been able to handle it for the last uh, 14 years without a real problem. And we're looking forward to working on this. And I might add that within uh, the end of this month, Garbanza of the Book will be published by uh, Arcadia Books. We already have one on Highland Park and just finished one on Garbanza as well. Read all about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, great job, Charlie. And I uh, just want to give uh, Charlie a shout out. Uh, in the mid-90s, uh, we established the largest HPLZ in the city of LA. And with the neighborhoods uh, and community folks' support, they really went building by building, taking pictures, uh, documenting the history of each structure. It's a tremendous effort, and uh, it's the largest under John Ferraro. We established the first one in Angelino Heights. But uh, thank you, folks, for your hard work. Councilman, please. Well, thank you, and I think it's, we could all agree it's been a very long journey, but we're, I think we're all very happy to be here. And we have seen and know the unique mix of architecturally and historically significant structures that exist in Garbanza, and it would be, really would be a treasure, uh, we would really lose a treasure should we 
uh, can not prevent the demolition of other structures there. Um, and it, it took many steps to get here. I was looking at my notes, and uh, you know, we took two interim control ordinances, uh, revisions to the initial study area, and now we're eventually deciding to combine the proposed governance HPLC with the existing Highland Park HPLC. I think this um, is respecting the limited resources within the planning department, and uh, it's also uh, while allowing us to continue with our end goal, which is to protect the Garbanza area. Uh, I too want to thank um, some of our community partners in this. Uh, there are many to name, but uh, certainly Rosa Rivas, who I don't see here, uh, Tina Miller, who took that walk, uh, Charles Fisher, and Carmela Gomez. Th thank you so much uh, for the work you've been doing. I also want to thank um, the planning department and uh, for your hard work. I've been very creative in our efforts to continue to move this forward. You've certainly heard the community and you've been very supportive and helpful. And finally, uh, I want to thank Reyes. You've been very enthusiastic about uh, doing, uh, allowing us to be part of the bigger H Highland Park um, HPLC. But I think uh, we're on a path. We've come up to some roadblocks. Um, planning is not easy in the city of Los Angeles. And when planning departments are created to sp speak about future development, you know, we're here asking to look about past development and how do we preserve that. Uh, but our planning department has uh, done its best to keep us moving forward within our limited resources. So thank you and uh, look forward to working with all of you to realize the finality of this. Thank you very much. So I, I anticipate a motion coming on. I move to approve the report. There will be a second. <laughs> all right, that will be the action of this committee. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for your hard work. I look forward to seeing you on the council floor. And when is this scheduled for on the, to be before council? Next week? OK, early next week. OK. All right, Roberto, what's next? Uh, item 12, council members, which is an appeal by Robert Chermo. He's appealing the action of the central APC um, relative to approval of a parking variance for 42 parking spaces in CD5. Good afternoon, Councilman. Maya Zaitsevsky. I was the uh, zoning administrator of record for this case. It's a restaurant with a bar. Um, they requested a conditional use permit for a full line of alcohol and a variance to provide uh, 42 off-site parking spaces uh, by covenant, um, excuse me, by a lease agreement in lieu of covenant. Uh, I approved it. it. It was appealed to the Central Area Planning Commission. They uh, um, had took testimony from a number of people and then uh, upheld my decision. And so what's before you today, the conditional use permit was not further appealable. So what you have before you today is just the parking variance. Um, that's the only part that was further appealable to council. Um, there's been a couple issues uh, raised in the appeal that were sort of new information. And I just want to clarify for the record um, that the appellant is saying that some of the spaces can't be um, leased for the term. Uh, or in the way that is required by the condition of approval in the ZA case. And if they can't comply with the condition, they can't get their, their variance. So I just want to make it clear that uh, if their lease is not for a year, or if the lease is not signed by the appropriate people, then they can't get the variance for the, um, the off-site parking, in which case they wouldn't be able to open the restaurant. But otherwise, you know, there was a lot of conditions of approval. There are some issues on the Third Street area with parking, with noise, with uh, um, lots of restaurants that have alcohol licenses. And I think that the conditions of approval take into account LAPD's concerns, neighbors' concerns. And um, I suggest that you uh, deny the appeal and uphold the Area Planning Commission's decision. Okay. Thank you very much. And we'd like to ask the... Um, the appellant to come on up. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Chernow, 5850 West Third Street. I'm here representing uh, the Homeowners Association that represents over 10,000 people in the community, Beverly Wilshire Homes. Uh, we are very concerned with this matter because, as uh, the zoning administrator has mentioned, there is a major parking problem in this community. Uh, most of the buildings, the majority, were built in the 1920s, early 30s. There were no requirements back then for the kind of parking requirements we have today, and the community has suffered. 
Um, I became involved in this at the time of the appeal. Uh, it very much bothers me that uh, the zoning administrator didn't mention to you that there are specific findings that are required to be made in order to grant a zoning variance. The California Supreme Court back in the 1960s found that uh, city councils were being uh, denied their right to enact laws and undermined by departments of planning uh, who are enacting zoning variances and granting them in violation of the law. Uh, they require that every city enact specific findings that must be made in order for a zoning variance to be granted. In the City of Los Angeles, that's Municipal Code Section 1227. And I've given you a copy of that code section. It specifically requires that the property be unique in some way, the size, shape, topography, location, or surroundings, and makes it very unique and at a disadvantage to all the surrounding properties. They must meet this finding in order to be granted a zoning variance. There is nothing unique about this property. Uh, the applicant had claimed that, in fact, it was unique because unlike all the surrounding properties, they had no on-site parking. And I went out to the property when I was asked to look into this matter, and what I found was they certainly don't have any on-site parking. It's because they built illegal structures over the on-site parking. They were, in fact, cited by the Department of Building and Safety for this violation. They ignored the notice to comply. They were also issued a notice of non-compliance. They are now facing possible criminal charges on those violations. Uh, the community has a right to make sure that a restaurant of this size has the adequate parking. And the laws are very clear here. They must find the specific findings provided in 1227. It can't be found here. It is not unique. And therefore, it should have been denied. Uh, we've had several meetings with Michael Brown on this matter, not only on this property, but several others. Uh, he's made now corrections so that his own administrators are aware that they're supposed to make these findings prior to granting the permits. Um, what this really comes down to is the fact uh, the applicant is a very wealthy family. They've tried to use their influence. They got, they're going to bring in a nice show for you in a little while. They have a lot of people coming here. They have quite a few signatures. And I've given you documentation here that, in fact, they are offering $25 gift certificates to anybody who signs their petitions. Uh, our homeowners association cannot afford to do that, nor would we allow that to happen. We want uh, this to be done in a fair manner, not based on how much money you have. Um, as far as the lease agreements that they did submit, uh, the requirements, as the zoning administrator just mentioned, are required to be a minimum of one year. The, the uh, documents that they submitted are, in fact, can be canceled within 90 days. So 90 days after it takes place, they can simply cancel it. A majority of the parking is at uh, the uh, Beverly Connection, which is now filling up with their own tenants. And once they fill up, this parking will no longer even be available. And that's why they want to have the opportunity uh, to be able to cancel this uh, agreement with a 90-day notice. So we are asking that, in fact, the law be abided here. This is not a question of, of, of money making a difference or the amount of people that have come here today. It's down to what the law requires. And the law requires under 1227 that if they can't make the findings that are required, then they must be denied the opportunity to have a zoning uh, variance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else here on behalf of the uh, appellant? Okay. Good day, Ms. Plotkin. Thank you for your patience. Mr. Reyes. My name is Diana Plotkin, 8443 West 4th Street, LA 90048. I am president of the Beverly Wilshire Homes Association, and of course, we are the ones who filed this appeal. I'm not going to go over all the issues. I'm just going to let you know, because I have another hearing to go to, that we do support whatever Mr. Cherno has said. But one issue I am going to bring up. In all the years that I've come before the city council, that I've come before the committees, that I've participated, which is far over 20 years, I have never had anyone threaten me to keep me from demonstrating my democratic right to participate in the system. I did from these people. And I want to make this letter a part of the record in case of there's future legal action. I find it offensive for them to try to keep the community out of the process by threatening the board of directors of Beverly Wilshire Homes with a lawsuit and me personally with a lawsuit. This is not a popularity contest. I am representing the community. 
this is legal. It is the law, and that's why we filed the appeal, and we would ask you to uphold it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parker. Um, we'll be closing public hearing, and we'll go through our cards now. We have, um, do we have the applicant? Because it's not clear on the, on the notes. Can I have the applicant come forward, please? And uh, the council office wants to speak first or last? Council office? Okay. Good day, ma'am. Good day. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, the time frame that I have is two minutes. Yes. Okay, thank uh, you. Elizabeth Peterson, 1850 Industrial Street, Unit 606, Los Angeles, California. Um, we would like you to respectfully uphold Zoning Administrator Maya Zazetsky's um, approval and the commission. We worked very hard on this case. Uh, the structure that was on the property was immediately removed. Um, they are part of a very special program that Council Member Paul Coretz put together. It is the Universal Parking Program on Third Street. It is something that is imperative to Third Street um, for future and also for other council members. Right now we have 42 parking spaces at the uh, Beverly Connection. Uh, those are by lease and Smot, Mott Smith who is authorizing that lease is here today. Uh, the condition extremely states that if we do not have uh, the parking or if it goes away, uh, the grant is null and void. This parking has to be maintained. My client has has spent the last 18 months supporting the Universal Valet Program for 3rd Street. Uh, they will have paid into the parking program for these spaces uh, for over 18 months, which is almost $40,000. Uh, the uh, Universal Parking Program is only allowed to allocate 50 parking spaces. They were in addition to the original parking that was built for the Beverly Connection, and um, it is really um, dedicated to this. Uh, the Lees have owned their property for 35 years. They own a half a block on 3rd Street near La Cienega. Their businesses have been there and are starting to fail. They have a battery store, a flooring store, and a dress shop. They're all run by the family. They got together as a family and said that they were going to put a business model together so they could continue to make a living and work together. They championed um, the CD5's universal parking program, rolled up their sleeves and got a part of it, which I think is the future for parking in LA, and they have been very committed. I think you're here to stay hear the dedication of the people in the community. We do have thousands of letters of support for this project. So I respectfully request that you uphold uh, the Zoning Administrator's decision and the Area Planning Commission on this. Um, and Paul Koretz has been very, very um, uh, careful in working with us. Uh, we had two personal meetings with him. We reduced the size and scope of the uh, business. We removed a patio. We removed entertainment. Uh, we changed the hours of the deli not to be 24 hours. Uh, if you know Ratner's Deli in um, New York from the West, uh, this is part of the same family and they are recreating that. Um, and they are enhanced and embroiled in this community as you will see today. Ms. Peterson, um, just for the record, were, were there offers of certificates or $25 no. coupons? No, and I can let my client address that in their two minutes if I could. Sure, but... Um, no, there were not offers at all. There was a, the letter that was given to you by Ms. Plotkin was regarding a fact that there was circulation, uh, that they wanted a 4 a.m. closing, different things that were posted on their website, and a letter that was sent door to door that was not accurate to what the request clause became and what it was noticed as. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on behalf of the applicant? Because I do have cards here. I'll, I'll call them out, but uh, the applicant uh, on record. Anybody on record? Please give us your name and address. Councilman uh, Benjamin Lee, 8480 West 3rd Street, Los Angeles, California, 90048. Um, if you see, we have a copy of the petition we've had signed. We had never offered any type of $25 gift certificate. We have sent an email to over thousands of people in our database, from community stakeholders to neighbors in the Council District 5. Um, thanking them for them, our, their support in regards to our restaurant and proposed project. Um, as a token of our appreciation, we did enclose in an email a $25 gift card. Um, if you see, you have all the content of the petition right here. We've got over a thousand signatures right there. 
and that's uh, available for you guys in your perusal. Thank you. Okay, I do have a, a card from Joanne Lee representing Ben Lee. Oh, she's the property owner. Okay, yes. so you, have you filled out one of these cards? I did not, know. Maybe you should. I'll go one, absolutely. Please, just for the, to complete the record. Next will be Joanne Lee. Hello, thank you for letting me speak. Technically, my husband is the property owner. I'm the wife. Okay. Um, we are residents of the neighborhood as well. We're very mindful of all uh, concerns of livability, regarding livability issues that Mrs. Plotkin has raised. However, we feel that her, her efforts and her, and her statements have been patently obstructionist, excessive, and wasteful, and has imposed um, financial hardship on us. We are on a downslide with our business. My husband is in a construction-related business. We need to make a switch, as many people do. They need to reinvent themselves at this time. And um, we're very, we feel very fortunate that we have our family members and his partner to draw upon, and we can draw upon their experience to make a great restaurant. Uh, all issues regarding build, the building and safety issues have been adequately addressed by our representatives. The building in question, the, the structure has been removed. We have not been notified of any criminal, <laughs> any criminal uh, charges against us. I work for LAPD, I would have heard, I'm sure that I would have heard that by now from my boss. And um, we, we're ready, and with every indication that we've got, we feel like we're going to be very successful. And I ask you to deny the appeal. Okay. In the interest of moving on and getting some, uh, getting some revenue to the city. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Saman Ebriani, I'd like to come up and speak. Then we'll have uh, Hernan de Hilalde. I'd like to come up and speak after Mr. Ebriani. Good day, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Saman Ebriani, 1875 Century Park East, Los Angeles 90067. Uh, I'm here in support of Mr. Ben Lee, the applicant. I've known him for about four years now, and uh, his restaurant endeavors have been very successful, and he has always been mindful of the public's interest, and uh, I'm very confident in his abilities with, this, with respect to this project. Um, I think in this economy, which is very stagnant at the moment, the best thing for the community to do is to approve this overall project. Um, I think the benefits outweigh any uh, risks and costs, and the economy, uh, the 75 jobs will probably be created as a result of this project, and I think that's probably the best way to go about it. Um, I think Mr. Benley already addressed the parking variance issues, and overall, I think uh, this project will be very beneficial for the community. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hernanda and Hernanda. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Hernan De La Halde, uh, 9600 Lucerne Avenue, apartment 20, Culver City, 90232. I've known the Lee family for about eight years since I've been the tutor of Ben Lee, and I've been following this case with them very closely for a long time. It's very, very difficult for me to understand how this has taken so long to decide, and yet I understand that there have been some objections raised. The objections to the parking variance and all that seems to me like a very small issue in the larger issue of the economic decline of Los Angeles. This is a, a business that will generate 75 jobs. It's already cost them a lot of money just to maintain themselves in this area this long. 75 jobs being created seems to me a much stronger issue, a much stronger argument than any problems that parking might, pre might present. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Hunter Hall. And then we'll have Joe Connolly. Good afternoon, sir. 
Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Hunter Hall, and I'm at uh, 8555 Beverly. Uh, I'm, I, w I do operations for a hotel in the area. It's about a block away from the future site. I uh, know Ben Lee and uh, Will Ratner professionally from the past. I'm a restaurateur myself. I have lots of operational experience, and I'm here to attest to their um, success rate and what they do and their expertise. And, you know, with most restaurants having a failure rate of, you know, around 95%, um, I don't think we can say that they've ever done that before, and they have a really good success rate. So what they do put in there, Ratners, will not only create a lot of jobs, but it'll be successful and around for several years instead of just flopping after six months because they know how to do it right. Um, and in terms of the parking, I live in that area, and I'm there every day, all day. It's sort of a farce. There's hundreds of parking spaces around at the Beverly Connection and at the Beverly Center. I mean, anybody can tell that. If you've ever been there, you know that. So, And the parking program that they're going to promote, the um, Universal Valet, in the end, will solve the parking problem. But if you don't allow new businesses to partake in that, it'll never happen, and you'll still have the same congestion in two years than you do now. So I'm here in support of Radnor's Deli. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Joe Connolly, and then we'll have Stuart Feldman. Hi, good evening. Long day. Uh, they say I talk fast, so if I talk fast, it's probably because I know you guys are had a long day, too. Uh, I, live Conley, I live at 2319 South Mansfield. I've been in this area with my family almost 70 years. I ran for LA City Council against the Honorable Jack Weiss. Uh, we let him win, so that was nice for you guys. Um, I advise Carmen Trutanich and the mayor on a program I run through this area. And Mid-City is probably the most decorated anti-graffiti, anti-crime program in the entire city. I'm massively involved with business interests throughout CD5 and CD10. I'd known the Lee family probably before your applicant, Benjamin Lee, was born. Sold them carpeting. While I sold carpeting for a living, I developed an anti-gang, anti-graffiti program at night. And um, it can save our city $250 million a year. I'm really interested in these type of projects because these type of projects are great for our city. As you know, and you run very hard districts, not as, not as uh, easy as CD5 and 10, um, you have really tough choices when the, bu the buildings are empty. When the buildings are empty, you invite crime. Um, I'm involved in this area. I was a president of a neighborhood association. I've run PTAs. I've done everything but get elected LA City Council person. So I have a large, vast knowledge of the city and businesses that are businesses in there that are high-end businesses in a tough economy is the thing that will sustain us. We need these businesses to stay here because as you know and I know, doing business in LA is tough. So when you have somebody trying to kill themselves to get into a business, we should embrace them. Um, our city needs these type of businesses. I am massively involved in the anti-crime in this entire area. Parking is the number one issue in every neighborhood association, whether it's the Valley, South Central, East LA. They have met every requirement to get rid of their parking. They, it looks like everything complies. The people that are complaining about them have a long history in the city of just nitpicking and throwing stuff up against the wall until it sticks. I think for once the city ought to grow some cajones and let these people build their business in there. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sounds like a candidate in the making. Stuart Feldman, Michael Kessler. Stuart Feldman. I live at 134 North Harper Avenue, LA 90048. I am not connected with the restaurant in any way, shape, or form. I just know these people. I live in the neighborhood, and it would be very nice to have a nice kosher delicatessen that I could walk to, having nothing to do with the parking because I'm only a few blocks away. But there's plenty of parking at the Beverly Connection. There's, Bever there's plenty of parking at the Beverly Center across the street. And in the neighborhood, there's always plenty of parking in the area. I don't know what the problem is with all this parking. But from reputations that I've heard, and in my opinion, people just keep appealing and appealing and appealing, hoping to get something more than a $25 certificate to let an appeal go by. Thank you. Michael Kessler, Level Klein, Level Klein, you here? Ari Friedman, then Mott Smith. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Lavi Klein. I live in. Uh, I live on 172 South Hudson Avenue, Los Angeles. 90004. I was born in Los Angeles, was privileged to live here all my life, primarily in the Hancock Park area. 
And uh, I'm here in, I'm actually an Orthodox Jew, and uh, I'm here in complete support for Ratner's Deli. And there are, there are a handful of reasons why I'm in complete support of Ratner's Deli. But to just elaborate on one issue is that as an Orthodox Jew, we have severe strict diet <coughs> restrictions, as known as kosher, and uh, we don't have too many kosher restaurants in the neighborhood. Maybe just one, and it's not really good either. So uh, when I was when I was told about the idea of Ratner's Deli, and I actually was privileged to eat at Ratner's Deli in New York, and if this Ratner's Deli promises to be just as half as good as Ratner's in New York. This is a big privilege to the Orthodox community of Los Angeles. And I'm actually here uh, with another individual representing 4,000 individuals of the Orthodox community of the La Brea Hancock Park neighborhood in complete support of Ratner's Deli. And I just want to end up by saying one last thing. To the individual behind me who has a grudge against Ratner's Deli, we need to open with God only. I will be the first one to order him a good old fashioned matzo ball soup, and he will change his mind as well. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, I will put in. Sounds like Ratner's Brigade here. <laughs> I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Ari Friedman. I live in Fuller off of 3rd Street. I'm here representing uh, my father, Andrew Friedman, the LA City Fire Commissioner, uh, as well as the President of the Congregation, based off Tully, which is also in the neighborhood. I'm also a supervisor with Hatzala Rescue Squad. I'm on the board of directors with them as well. Uh, it's almost 5 o'clock. My wife texted me while I was waiting here while we're eating for dinner. And uh, right off the footsteps of Lavi, uh, there really is only one kosher restaurant in uh, one uh, kosher restaurant in the La Brea Fairfax Third uh, Street district. And uh, as he mentioned, uh, I, uh, I told my wife we don't want to order from the one uh, that currently exists. It would be really nice and refreshing to go and order from nice established deli such as Ratner's. I lived uh, in New York for four years while I was uh, in college. Ratner's was around at that time and has a uh, incredible reputation and uh, bringing that type of business to Los Angeles as well as enhancing our uh, uh, kosher menu would be a great benefit to me as well as the entire community at large. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Rod Smith, Thomas Rothschild, and Bernie Zepstein. We'll conclude with Blake Jackson. I'm Rod Smith, representing uh, well, the public valley program on West 3rd Street. I'm, I'm not here in support or in opposition to the program. I just wanted to provide some facts about the public valley that might be helpful in making your decision. As you know, it's a huge problem in districts all throughout Los Angeles where you've got walking streets and the desire for restaurant uses where uh, in order to satisfy zoning requirements, applicants are forced to go and do off-site parking leases. There's no central mechanism for managing the allocation of parking spaces this way in the city. Um, there's no standard for lease agreements, no standard for valet operations that service this, this, this parking. And as a result, you end up with a lot of legitimate concerns from neighborhoods about people so-called double dipping in parking spaces, about uh, bad valet operators. Um, we're very pleased the business community came together on West 3rd Street with the, with the help and support of the council office to produce a more credible, more transparent program. Uh, most of our parking is at the Beverly Connection. And um, just to be totally clear about it, by agreement between the Beverly connection of the council office, that parking will be available in perpetuity. Um, the actual operating capacity of the Beverly Connection is not an issue um, because this is above code parking. Um, and if they ever hit capacity, we have attendants that will stack cars and park cars in aisles and, and achieve that capacity. So the, the actual capacity is not at risk at all. Um, and we're very pleased that parking provided to any restaurant such as Ratner's under this program helps support neighboring businesses by opening up the valet service to everybody. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Matt Smith. Thomas Rothschild. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Rothschild, and I live in L.A., and I'm in support of Ratner's opening because of bringing a new restaurant to L.A., and in these tough times we're having that, it would be nice to bring 75 new jobs as well. Thank you, sir. Very succinct. Bernice Epstein? Not here. Blake Jackson? And then we're here from the office, uh, Mr. Christopher Coombs. Hi, Blake Jackson. I live at 1850 Whitley. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today and give my support to Ratner's Deli. I partook in the collecting of support petition signatures throughout Council District 5 and found it to be quite an easy task. Uh, 
I have five years of experience working on statewide and local ballot initiatives and found that getting people to support Ratners is one of the easiest petitions, if not the easiest petition I've ever done. Uh, but only due to the fact that people are pro-business in this economy and are concerned about the amount of businesses closing down in the area. These are people from all walks of life. There are people who are happy to sign and some said, I need a job. Most were perplexed as to why a restaurant would need a petition to open. And when I explained that the project was being tied up through appeals in the, by a local homeowners association and we're now on the third line, the public's decision to sign was almost unanimous. If someone wouldn't sign, it was because they didn't feel comfortable putting their information down on the petition. In fact, people who know of the Homeowners Association agreed to the difficulties of dealing with them, and many people knew of Magnolia's Bakery that was dealing with the same uh, appeal process from the same Homeowners Association. Um, and as for the parking situation, everyone I spoke with agreed that the Beverly Center would be more than adequate to provide parking for a small restaurant that has tons of traffic in that area. So, and uh, dealing with these people, they're professional, and um, it was a pleasure to work for them in that short period of time. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. And last but not least, our council representative. How do you do? Good afternoon, or good late afternoon, council members, and thank you for sticking in, in there on the late day. Um, first, I know there was a little bit of back and forth on both sides. I mean, I have to say, while Councilman Koretz respectfully disagrees with this appellant, I, I think they come from a good place, and they're here because they care about their community. But in this particular case, in regards to this particular restaurant, um, you got the same set of petitions that we received. You heard the same thing we heard from the zoning administrator, that there are strict conditions on this restaurant, and if they can't meet those conditions, they'll never even open up. We feel that they will meet those conditions and that they will follow them to the letter of the law. Um, to talk just briefly about the parking in this situation, this location is across the street from the Beverly Connection, which is a, a retail shopping center um, adjacent to the Beverly Center, the center that most people know. When that project went through a major remodel, we assured that there was not only extra parking, but that there is a condition on that case that runs in perpetuity where they're able to stack cars, to not only have these extra hundred spaces, but to in fact expand that significantly beyond that number. And we had them model out for the, the biggest shopping day of the year, for the day after Thanksgiving, and there will still be enough spots to park all the cars to meet their needs as well as the 100 spots for 3rd Street. So it's a little bit frustrating that, you know, that, that wasn't an easy task to get those extra parking spaces for 3rd Street, and, and now we're being told by the appellants that we shouldn't use them. Um, we have a space that's underperforming, that could perform well as a restaurant, that could be a community asset. Um, and is across the street from this pool of parking, and we do feel it's appropriate to grant the variance to utilize that parking. Um, we feel this restaurant will be a community asset. It's a deli. It's going to be at a price point that is affordable for normal working people, and not all of the restaurants on um, Third Street are at that price point. And you know, whatever you may think of CD5, in fact, we have some very wealthy people, but we have a good number of people. They get up in the morning and they go to work and they work normal jobs and they can only afford normal priced food and this deli is going to be a great thing for them. Um, we feel it'll be a positive improvement to the site. It'll create jobs, not only the long-term jobs of those that work there, but particularly the jobs to finish the internal construction of this, those construction jobs in an industry that has you know, 40, 50 percent unemployment. We think it's a positive thing, and we ask that you deny the appeal. Thank you. Any questions from the council representative? See them. And I believe the mayor's office is here also. Mayor's office is here. Do we have a card? That they're not. You guys. Just kidding. Just watching. Okay. You're welcome to speak. You are welcome to speak, though. All right. Um, anything else like to add? Um, yeah, for the record, Maya Zaitsevsky, um, just because there's been some changes since the APC hearing, I just want to sort of clarify for the, the record. Um, I just had a couple questions. The uh, 
parking is now all 42 spaces it appears to be at, located at the Beverly connection that's a, a change from what was heard at the area planning com Commission so I just want to make sure that that is correct that that all 42 spaces are provided there I would just like to know from mr. Mott Smith why there's a 90-day term on the lease instead of a one-year lease if he can explain that and if they can comply with the condition I want to make sure if, if you're considering approving this that they can comply comply with the condition of approval um, they said that they eliminated a structure on the building so it means we'd need a revised site plan um, and then I also want to know if there's going to be parking on site now that they've moved this illegal structure so if we can just these, clarify these don't sound like small changes well it just all came up now and you know we don't want to bring this up at council I'd rather get it taken care of right now okay so the, mr. Smith did you hear every point um, sure I, I'll respond to the issues that, that I'm aware of the lease agreement is the most important one um, the uh, our lease is actually stronger than the vast majority of leases that are used to support off-site parking in the city most leases are one-year term with 30-day cancellation clauses ours is a one-year term with a 90-day cancellation clause and the reason why we extended the standard cancellation clause in 30 to 90 days is because um, excuse me that's uh, that's my lawyer Colin just kidding um, the reason we did that is because um, we thought it was important I tried Thank you. Um, uh, the, the, re the reason we do that is because uh, part of this is part of the public valet operation um, again we're committed to transparency and should either party default on the lease or terminate the lease we wanted to have enough time to be able to notify the council office the city the zoning administrator that the lease is no longer valid and the occupancy was no longer valid uh, in the restaurant and we felt 90 days gave us more time than the standard 30-day termination provision that most one-year leases have but I do want to clarify it's not a 90-day term it is a one-year term for the lease so and we only have 35 at the uh, at the Beverly connection my and these uh, conditions that we're hearing right now uh, are you comfortable with is it consistent with the intent of your report the, the condition says it has to have a one-year um, uh, term of the lease so I have to take a look at it and see um, I, I was confused by the the 90 day language that was brought up by mr. Cherno so he's saying there's 35 at the Beverly connection so that's consistent with what was previously approved by the Area Planning Commission so then it just leaves us with the um, that they've moved uh, the structure that was illegally constructed and I want to know if there's going to be parking available can, can you say that one more time but a little bit slower ah. <laughs> they removed a structure that was illegally um, built in the rear of the property and does that now provide parking on site and that's the question yeah and if we need to if since it's been removed do we need to revise I think we need a revised site plan as well can we get feedback on that yes the structure was removed there is one ADA parking space on site okay and that makes it more accommodating for your patrons correct Okay, and do we need a site plan? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the site plan's changed. Okay. The, I, I don't know if this was included as part of the uh, restaurant square footage. I'm assuming it was, so we would need to have any revised plans done. Do, do any of these changes require us to continue this, or will this be these? So as uh, long as they can get it to us, I think it's going to council next Tuesday. That's my question is, do you have enough time to produce the necessary documents to make sure everything is in order? I do, but that is not that is not increasing the square footage of the restaurant at all. It's I, I can produce a site plan, yes, in time. But it does not change the square footage of the restaurant. Okay. Maya? I may provide one clarification. I just reviewed the lease document. Um, it turns out that it, the lease does not expire. It is an unlimited lease that operates until it's terminated. And there's a 90-day uh, notice provision in there, but it, it has an unlimited term. Okay. Well. Okay. And then the other thing is these. The, so now they have two two parking locations so we need to just make sure that by the time it goes to City Council that they have a lease agreement that uh, complies with the one-year term on the other property so the their other location has seven parking spaces we need to make sure it has a one-year term okay I and 
The only thing I, I would like to add is if possibly you would like to require a plan approval in a year to make sure that the parking is, um, uh, the parking plan is working as proposed. I don't know if that will give you some additional comfort because their legitimate concerns are brought up by the, the community members and the appellants. And so if that would help you in any way, we could require them a year after they. Oh, I think they are very healthy to have a review. And if you think a year is, is from operation, from right. operation. Here from when they start operations. We'll give us sufficient uh, indicators, then that's what we should do. Right. One year. Okay. We could add that as a condition if you, if you feel and it's warranted. I think that would be a healthy thing to do for all parties to get that assessment within one year. Uh, Mr. Turner, I saw you shaking your head. I just want to make sure I give you time to, to respond. I appreciate but that. Uh, I gave you copies of the, uh, it's not a lease agreement, it's an assignment. It has no one year stated on it. It just says on it that it can be terminated by other, either party within 90 days. And if in fact they have this parking for long term, then I asked them to show us a lease agreement for a minimum of one year, which is required under condition nine. They do not have it. They don't have the required parking. I gave you notices to comply along with a notice of non-compliance. There was not only the structure they removed, I have the pictures here that were taken yesterday. There was a warehouse that was illegally built over the required parking. It is still there. I went there an hour before I came here. It is still there. They put a piece of paper in front of my lens trying to prevent me from taking the pictures. Uh, again, if we're going to have a fair hearing here today, I think you need to know all of the evidence here. I've given you the documentation. This is not coming just from me. I gave you the proof there. Um, I'm very disappointed by the fact that the law requires that this property be unique in some way. It is not. They are not entitled under the law to be granted a zoning variance. And if you're going to set a precedent here, then anybody who wants to come before the city and decide that they want to profit and make higher uh, a profit on a property is going to general. ask for that zoning Thank variance. You, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Maya, can you come up? Is there a way to prove that this structure was demolished? Is there a way to, pro to prove? To prove it. We, I can contact Building and Safety and, and find out what's going on there. Let's get the clarity before we at least make that part of the record when it comes to council to address Mr. Turner's assertions. Yeah, and just um, sort of as... Uh, uh, to speak to what he just mentioned about sort of the uniqueness of the property, um, like all these uh, sort of stores that were built a long time ago on Third Street, none of them have adequate parking um, for more than just like a, a minor retail uses. And their, their retail uses are failing, and they want to change it to a restaurant. The city has has an agreement with the Beverly Connection to provide parking for this specific reason because this Beverly Connection has excess parking. So I think the unique situation is they have right across the street from them this parking that's allocated just for this purpose. They're paying to have a valet stand right in front of their property. And, um, you know, it's, it's just not um, a typical situation where they're just being granted a variance with no that the findings can't be made. This, the findings can be made in this situation. Okay, and that is reflective of the universal parking program and its intention? Yeah. It's okay. right across the street. They have a valet stand, and they have a lease agreement with them. It's exactly what was envisioned to, to deal with this problem in 3rd Street. Gotcha. And it's probably something similar will be used in other areas of the city that are, like, similar problems. But Right. Okay. Colleagues, any other questions or observations? And uh, I would move that we, uh, given all the information that's in front of us, and understanding that the clarity of the documents will be presented before council, and that the staff will be introducing all the necessary documentation that addresses the concerns that have been raised to make sure that all the information is updated. In response to Mr. Turner's concern as well, um, I would uh, move to deny the appeal filed by Mr. Robert Turner on behalf of the Beverly. Wilshire Homes Association sustained the entire decision of Central APC and approve a variance to permit 42 required parking spaces through a lease agreement and live a covenant for property at 8480, 8482 West 3rd Street subject to conditions of approval. Do I have a second? I have a second? Okay. Council. Okay, so that'll be a unanimous vote on the committee and uh, we look forward to seeing you in council. Roberto, anything else? Uh, public comment. Anybody here for public comment? 
Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.